Perfect. Thanks, Christina. Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Stopping Algal Bloom Toxins at the Kitchen Tap. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Glenn Lipscomb. Dr. Lipscomb is a professor in the chemical engineering department at the University of Toledo. He received his BS from the University of Missouri and his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. After working for three years at Dow Chemical developing gas separation membranes, he was at University of Cincinnati before becoming the chair of the chemical engineering department at Toledo. His research interests have revolved around the use of membrane science and engineering. We're delighted to have Dr. Lipscomb here today to talk about his work on removing harmful algal bloom toxins by way of membranes. But before we do that, a few logistical mentions. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 1220, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during his talk. And I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Lipscomb at the end of his presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post the webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Glenn Lipscomb from the University of Toledo who will present Stopping Algal Bloom Toxins at the Kitchen Tap. Dr. Lipscomb. Well, thank you very much, Jill, for the, the great introduction and hope everybody's having a, a nice lunch as they listen to this here. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen right now so you can see uh, some slides I have to share with you. Jill, can you see them? They, they look perfect, thanks. Great. Well, then I'll proceed to, to talk about some of our work on using membranes to treat a water at the tap that might be contaminated with, with microcystin. And so this work has been the effort of a number of people over the years, including Neelam Ajagani and Arslan Sapari, two graduate students here at the University of Toledo, Xavier Johnson, an undergraduate, as well as Dr. Choi and Dr. So, who are both in the civil and environmental engineering department here. So just to give you a brief idea of what I'm going to cover, I'll talk about membranes, just introduce what they are and, and what they can do, and the objectives of our work and then summarize that in terms of the membrane characterization that we did for salt removal, which is a surrogate, initial surrogate for cyanotoxin removal, and then in terms of cyan cyanotoxin removal. And then finally talk about some, some conclusions and next steps. Well, what are membranes? Well, membranes are material that allow selective transport. So I'm gonna use this diagram right here to illustrate what I mean by that. You can think of this membrane, this blue bar right here is a plastic sheet. So just imagine a plastic sheet. On one side of it, you're going to contact that plastic sheet, that membrane, with some mixture, a, a gas mixture, say air that has particulate matter in it, or a liquid mixture. Let's say it's water that has salt in it. If we contact this mixture, this gas or liquid mixture with this membrane, and push on it, and try to push stuff across the membrane, only parts of that mixture will go across to form what we call the permeate. What's left behind, the reject, will just be collected on top of the surface of the membrane and then removed by flowing across it tangentially. Well, how does this membrane work? We can think of this membrane with this little diagram right here, this cartoon. I've taken a section of it, cross-section, and blown it up. So here's the cross-section, these blue bars here. This membrane is actually porous. So you can see these pores right here. They have somewhat uniform size. If I contact this filter, let's think of this now as a filter, with a liquid mixture that has these big blue circles, these red needles, and these small green circles. The small green circles are going to be able to easily get through these pores, whereas these big blue ones cannot. So if we push on this liquid mixture, on let's say this water solution has these materials in it, the green circles can go through, but the big blue ones won't. This red uh, 
needle right here can get through, but very it'll take a lot of work for it to orient itself. It'll take some time for it to orient itself in exactly the right conformation to come through. So although it might pass through, it's going to pass through at a much slower rate than these green circles because it has to acquire that one particular orientation in order to get through. We can further enhance the ability for this to be a filter by charging the surface of the membrane. So for instance, we create a positive charge on the surface. If we have a series of small green circles right here, one that's positive charge, one that's negative charge, and one that's neutral, the neutral one will be unaffected by the surface charge. The positive one will be repelled by it. So although it's small enough to go through, the positive charge on the membrane surface will, will prevent it from coming th going through, or at least reduce the rate at which it goes through, while the negative one can still pass through. We're already using membranes. You're already using materials that allow selective transport. When you make a cup of coffee in the morning, you selectively remove the brewed coffee from the grounds using a coffee filter. When you put an air filter in your furnace, you're selectively removing the pet dander, the particles that build up in the air in your house using this membrane right here. In your car, you have a fuel filter, selectively remove any particulate matter that might get in the gasoline before it goes into the engine for combustion. So you're already using membranes in everyday life to remove things from gas and liquid mixtures. But you can think of the membranes I'm gonna talk about as similar to these, but they are actually small, the holes are small enough that we're filtering molecules. We can filter oxygen from nitrogen. We can filter microcystin from water. This slide is rather busy, so I, I hope that you uh, aren't too overwhelmed by it here, but what it shows on here is the size range of the particles that we're going to be removing from these gas and liquid mixtures along the top. From the far right over here, and these are particles that would be the size of, of millimeters, things you could see, down here to things that are atomic size, that are nanometer size, that requires fancy scanning tunneling microscopes in order to see them. To remove particles from this, across the size range up here, from millimeters to nanometers, the types of membrane processes you would need are shown down here on the bottom, from particle filtration all the way down to reverse osmosis. And in the middle here are examples of particles you encounter in everyday life. And what we can do is we can find these in here, determine their size, what membrane process is needed to remove them. And I'm gonna start off by looking at viruses. So let's look at viruses. So here's viruses in the spectrum here, this membrane spectrum. This is a very famous chart illustrating membrane separation processes. But they can take on a range of sizes from this far end over here, if we go up, this is about 0.1 micron to around 0.01 micron. That's the actual physical size but the type of membrane process that you would need to remove them would be called an ultrafiltration membrane process. These ultrafiltration membranes have pore sizes that are small enough that these viruses can't pass through. The pores are smaller than the sizes up here at the top, the 0.1 micron to 0.01 micron. And there's other things on here. If you want to look and see later, we can do that, what types of membrane process you, you need to remove the particles of, that are of interest to you. What about these cyanobacterial toxins? Well, one of the most common ones, most widely studied ones, the microcystins. I'm going to turn my light on here because when it thinks I'm sitting here idle, it turns the light off on me. But the microcystins are illustrated here as this chemical form, this chemical diet structure. These are cyclic uh, heptapeptides that have two variable residues. The red sections right here are the two variable ones. And microcystin LR, we have an arginine as one of them and a, a leucine as the other. Well, we can draw them on a computer and we can look at their size there. We can also potentially crystallize these or measure their size in solution. And we find if we do that is that these have sizes, a size that ranges from about one to 1 1.5 nanometer. Where does that fall in that filtration spectrum? Let's go see where that is. So here's a big blue dot illustrating the rough size of these microcystin um, molecules. And if we come straight down here, we see that a nanofiltration membrane or a reverse osmosis membrane, because it's removes things that are even smaller, should do a good job at removing microcystin. And so this is the, the motivation for this work. So what we hope and what we have been able to see is that if we take a liquid mixture that has microcystin in it, here's all these water molecules, and we contact it with this membrane, this porous sheet right here, is that the water molecules, the small ones can pass through, but this, these microcystin molecules will not be able to, they'll be rejected. So the permit that we form will not have the microcystin in it. Well, there's been people have looked at this and have realized that reverse osmosis membrane should do a pretty good job of taking out microcystin. And so we're building upon this, this past work that you see here, these two examples. And there's been uh, a number of other studies since then. 
In particular, we focused on the use of home RO systems. And so where do you find these home RO systems? Well, these are ones you just put, you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you put underneath the sink. And so here's one example. This is the APEC Essence system that's put underneath the sink. I'll just go briefly through how you would you would use this. Um, you would con connect the system to the cold water line underneath the sink here. So you split the line so you have some of the cold water line coming into the, the water treatment unit here, the home RO unit, and the other part going up to the tap. Um, this system consists of more than just RO. It treats the water in multiple ways. Uh, there's a first stage right here. There's actually five stages in total. This first stage takes out large sediment, so you don't foul up the, the membrane itself. The next two consist of carbon filters that help absorb flavor components that you don't like and other uh, materials that might be present in the water that other molecules that you don't want to drink. Then it passes through the RO membrane, which is right here, this long cylinder right here, which does the final purification. This, the water that comes out of here is then sent to a storage tank where you can uh, purify water and have it ready to use. And then we take the water out of the tank, it goes through one polishing step in case there are some flavor components or other materials that were added in the storage tank right here. So we're gonna focus in not on all these other parts of it, all five parts of it. We're just gonna focus in on this one module right here in the middle, the reverse osmosis membrane module right in the middle there. That'd be the fourth stage in this five stage treatment process. So our objectives were to, to see, first of all, do these home RO membranes offer protection, reduction in, in microcystin concentration? We looked at three different products from blue, Pure Blue H2O, APEC, and Whirlpool, and we evaluated their performance as RO membranes, their ability to reject salt, as well as their microcystin rejection, and then their chlorine resistance, because we know there's chlorine in water, and, and chlorine is known to degrade these membranes. So how do we do this? Well, we took the membrane, the membranes come when you buy them in the cylindrical form here. This is called in the, the membrane industry, a spiral wound module. It consists of a membrane that's been wrapped around a central tube here, this white tube. And you can see the Elam over here is unrolling that module. So you can see the membrane as it's being unrolled, it's been wrapped around that central tube. Uh, we, we'll cut a piece of this membrane out. We'll put it into our test cell here, and then we'll run through this test cell the solutions that we're interested in, we're going to run through here water to just to measure how fast water can go across the membrane, water plus salt, to see how well it rejects salt, and then water plus microcystin to see how well it rejects microcystin. So this is one of the common measurements you would do on a reverse osmosis membrane, which is testing its hydraulic permeability. You measure the water flow rate across the membrane. I'm not going to talk about the, the, the unit here. It's a little funny unit, but this is water flow rate across the membrane as a function of the water pressure we applied to it. So here you can see that we varied the pressure from 40 up to nearly up to 90 PSI. We measured the water flow rate and the water flow rate increased in a linear fashion. And the slope of that line is what's called the hydraulic permeability to measure how easily water by itself can go across the membrane. You like that to be high, so a small unit can treat a lot of water for you. We measured this hydraulic permeability for the three different types of home RO units, the Blue H2O, the APEC, and the Whirlpool. And you can see that there is some variability in the hydraulic permeability. And this is in slightly different units. So it's, this is not flow rate, this is hydraulic permeability. So, so there is some variability between the units. And even within a unit, if we take multiple samples out, there's some variability within that unit. So we're interested in trying to characterize that as well, how much variability there was and whether that would be important. The next uh, test we did was look at how well does it reject salt from a, a saline solution. So for our feed to the cell, we had salt, sodium chloride dissolved in water. We uh, pushed this through the cell under pressure at different pressures and at different salt concentrations. And we measured the salt concentration in the permit that we produced here. Salt rejection is defined to be the concentration of salt that was in this feed minus a concentration that's in the permit divided by the concentration that's in the feed that you see here. If this permeate has no salt in it, then the numerator of this fraction is the concentration of the feed, we divide by the concentration of the feed, so this ratio will be one. So we, said we would see a value of one when plotted here for the salt rejection, if all the salt was rejected, none of it was able to pass across the membrane. The membrane was perfect. And what we see is that for these membranes is that we don't get perfect salt rejection. Their values are less than one from 0.9 roughly down to 0.6. And it depends upon the concentration of salt. But regardless of that, these do reject salt, so they do have some promise for rejecting microcystin. We also did this test for all of the membranes we were looking at, the blue H2O, the APEC, the Whirlpool. We measured the 
rejection. Here it's expressed as a percentage. So those numbers are multiplied by 100. So 100 would be 100% rejection. We see for all of them the same types of trends is that as we increase the salt concentration from three to nine, going from blue to red to green, there's a re reduction in rejection, which is expected. And we also see there is some variability in the rejection if we take samples from within the same unit, so the same cartridge, the same module. And there's between units, there is some variability, but the variability is not quite as great as there was in terms of the hydraulic permeability. So ideally, if you want to use a, a, a membrane for rejecting microcystin, you would have you'd like to see the salt rejection at least be as high as possible. So we went on to do the, the test of microcystin. We drew upon the existing literature about how do you test microcystin rejection using different types of products, not just membranes, but also using adsorptive products, using carbon adsorption. And NSF International is taking a, a, a key role in trying to develop protocols for doing this. They originally developed the P477 protocol for testing products, primarily adsorption products, carbon adsorption. And they recently expanded to their 53, their NSF NC53, with a recent 2020 modification to a testing protocol. This protocol calls for challenging the product with a feed concentration of four micrograms per liter of microcystin and demonstrating that can reduce the product concentration less than 0.3 micrograms, which is, you'll see in a moment, is a level recommended by health organizations. What complicates testing and, and certifying these products is that it's costly. It's very, very costly. And so, and it's expensive to get all the different types of forms of microcystin if you wanted to do this for all the different forms of microcystin. So there's a huge challenge in terms of trying to, to certify different products for a wide range of, of microcystins that you might see or in any of the other uh, toxins that would be produced by blue-green algae. Well, what did we see for the three membranes that we, we were looking at, the three home units? So these are the APEC blue H2O whirlpool units plotted on here. They're rejection without any ex chlorine exposure for a feed of five, of, sorry, four micrograms per liter. And the detection limit for measuring it was less than 0.3, about 0.25 micrograms per liter. So this is the rejection as a function of pressure. This value here is zero. That number, that dot right here, just to show you what the feed was, it was four. But we had no discernible, no detectable microcystin LR in our product, for, in the product water, the permeate water, for any of the feed pressures that we use, for any of the membranes that we use. So these membranes were able to reject the microcystin from the water to a non-detectable level. So indeed, they were able to, to do what we had hoped, that they were able to take the microcystin out of water. What about exposure to chlorine? Well, we did the same test, measuring the concentration of the microcystin in the permeate as a function of chlorine exposure. And chlorine exposure is done by taking the membrane and dipping it into chlorine solutions. You can change the parts per million or the uh, milligrams per liter as, as you would like, and you you measure the, the concentration of chlorine and the time that the membrane was exposed to it. And it's that product, the concentration, in this case, it's expressed as parts per million times the hours it was exposed to that. That is, the, is a, how we're measuring the chlorine exposure. And as you go from a small number to a large number, you're exposing it to chlorine, either at a higher chlorine concentration or for a longer period of time. And we did this for the blue H2O and the Whirlpool membranes up to about 5,000 ppm hours. And what we saw is that there was no change in the reduction in, in concentration. We, there was no discernible microcystin in the, in the permeate that was produced. It was well below the EPA 10-day advisory for adults of 1.6 parts per billion, which is a, also the same unit as, same value as micrograms per liter. And it was below the, the EPA 10-day advisory for uh, children under six, so which is 0.3 parts per billion. We saw something a little bit different when we looked at the APEC unit, what we saw here was that there was a change. So up to 8,000 ppm, we saw no, no change. But then as we went to 12,500, 18,000, we did see a, a change in the reduction of microcystin concentration. It went from four uh, down to non-detectable for the lower chlorine exposures at, for all the pressures that we see here. But as we went up to higher chlorine exposures, we started to see microcystin levels in the permeate rise to above the advisory level for children under six at 12,500, and then ultimately up at 18,000 parts per million exposure, part, parts per million hour exposure, we saw a, a rise above the EPA 10-day advisory for adults. So there was an effect after this exposure. Now, what does that really translate into? I'll talk about that in just a moment. Is that a lot of exposure? Is that something we'd expect at home? I'm going to talk about that in the conclusions here. 
So just to, to conclude here is that these home RO units do appear to offer significant protection against MCLR. They're able to reduce the concentration to non-detectable levels when they were taken right out of the box. The chlorine stability is actually pretty good. If you were to expose a, a membrane at home to four parts per million chlorine, which is what you would have in a pool, at the water that the tap water comes in is supposed to have a value less than three and ideally around one or even lower. If you were to expose it to four ppm for a year, you would have 35,000 parts per million hour year per year. Um, which would be higher than what we tested at, but this would be an absolute limit um, that you would expect. And therefore, for home use, where you, you're turning it on and off, you would not likely exceed the levels that we had uh, tested at. One thing we did not look at was the effect of other water components with natural organic matter or other salts. So that's something that was left, uh, we, we don't are able to answer at this time. The results also suggest maybe we can use nanofiltrate. We don't have to use RO, reverse osmosis. We could use a membrane that has a slightly larger pore. And also we did not look at other cyanotoxins um, in our results, so, or mixtures of them. And I have one more slide I'd like to conclude with here is that if you're interested in NSF certified products, they do have certified products that have been certified with the two standards for uh, microsystem reduction. And these are almost exclusively these carbon adsorption systems. There's a, a link here for doing that. And also I'll point out is that when NSF does certify these products, they do add this warning statement in here is that these are not designed to treat water straight out of a, a lake that has it high advisory levels of, of microsystem present in them. They're only for use on water supplies that have been treated to public water system standards is what they're certifying them for. And then they add in the end here, in the event of a cyanotoxin notification that you're supposed to follow the recommendations of your drinking water authority. And so with that, I suspect there may be some questions. I'd love to hear your questions and comments. And I'll, Jill, if you want to come back in, then we'll, we'll see what we can do with those. Yes, well, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. We have gotten some great questions during the presentation. So let me uh, get started. I'll ask you as many as we can and what questions Dr. Lipscomb can't answer today. We'll post later on the website with his answers. Um, so first question um, that I had gotten was you had talked about the uh, RO systems. How much are those how much do those cost? That's a good, good question. Uh, it, of course, it depends on where you buy them and who you buy them from and the number of stages, but you could probably buy a system that just has an RO membrane in one of those five stages for under $200. And you could spend up to $500 just for the unit. If you feel comfortable installing it at home, you can do so. But if you want a plumber to come in, they're probably going to add on an equal amount in terms of having it installed. OK. Um, Another question that we had gotten was, um, is there any concern about the bacteria colonizing around the membranes and continuing to increase the microcystin concentrations? That is, uh, that, that's another really good question. One of the banes of membranes is having biomass grow inside the, the, the membrane unit. And that would be abated to some degree by the filters, the pre-filters that are in that, that unit. And I could probably go back here and show you this. Um, so if when you buy the RO unit, this is the RO unit here, this long cylinder here. But before that, there's typically a five micron or maybe even a smaller filter right here to try to take out those larger biomat, whether it be bacteria um, or other cells that are present in it or algae. Um, if this is coming from the your water supply has been treated, they will, they will not be in there, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. But there is possibility for, for microorganisms to get into the system at some point. Um, if, because the water supply, although it's treated to help reduce those, and it's got residual chlorine in order to make sure they don't grow as it goes through the wire distribution system, there will be some that can potentially get through. You can have some growth in here. But in the, the work that, that, that we did here, we didn't look at that. But for these units at home, I would expect that not to be a major problem because of the water treatment that this, the membrane has seen before, or the water, the treatment the water has, has seen before it gets to the membrane, so. All right, another question that we had was, uh, you had talked about microcystin going through the membrane. What other um, algal toxins um, have you tested or, and um, are they equal in, in microcystin in terms of pulling out that microcystin? 
Uh, that's an interesting question too. Uh, what I would say, let's go back to the chart right here. If we know the size, and these are all, they could be a, a, a different size molecules, but I, I think they're all gonna be around this particular size right here. And then we would see very good removal with a nanofiltration membrane potentially, but certainly with a reverse osmosis membrane. So look at the other congeners and other types of, of toxins that are present that are produced by blue-green algae. I would expect them to re be removed with equal efficacy. Sorry, I was having problems with my mute. Um, another question uh, was, um, can you talk a little bit about why chlorine uh, does what it does to membranes? I'm not sure if how many of you have, have pools, but we, we have a pool at home and we put a plastic cover on the top of it to reduce water loss and to keep it warm. And over time, the chlorine in the pool just basically eats up. It, there's a chemical reaction that is, occurs between the polymer that, is, that is, is, constitutes the membrane and the chlorine. And that leads to the polymer being broken down into small pieces and basically just being uh, pulled away from the surface of the membrane. Uh, it'll just uh, be washed out and therefore you, you lose your membrane completely, just like you, you, you lose your, your pool cover. Do you know like how long it would take if like the average the average daily water use how often a filter would have to be re replaced, uh, given that chlorine causing an effect on them. Yeah, I, I, I would think that every six months would would be really good and would provide you a safety factor and I think even the manufacturer will recommend that you do that just because of the fact that you do get, there will be some microbial growth. Um, you, there will be some chlorine degradation, but by doing it every six months, which here's the, the target number that we had here um, in terms of chlorine contact, our, our measurement of how long and what concentration that the membrane can see. Um, if you're well below that, I wouldn't expect there to be a problem, so. Um, what are the, um, this was a question we had about the back flushing requirements for these types of membrane systems. The membrane systems, filtration systems often are, are back flushed, but these units are not designed to be back flushed. They, they are only operated in a forward mode. And so it's not, it's physically not possible to back flush the, the RO, RO membrane, so. Okay. Um, we had a couple of questions dealing with if there are different, so let, let me read one. Um, do you know what the microstin, and this is kind of specific, so um, do you know what the microcystin level in municipal water levels in Alberta, they think it, the standard is 20 parts per billion, and with this concentration, would there be will there be any added benefit for this RO system for those um, municipal water supplies? And, and the answer to, to that really depends upon the regulating authority. Uh, there, are, there are different standards that depend upon who you talk to, whether it's an organization like the EPA here in the US or whether it's an organization in Canada or organization in Europe. Um, but the EPA advisory is that you're not to exceed 1.6 parts per billion over a 10 day time frame. And so uh, we're at, and for children, it's, it's less than 0.3. So, so I, I don't know what specifically the, the guidelines are there in Canada. I, I couldn't answer that. Okay. Uh, does a RO system slow the rate of the water coming out of the tap? Do you know? It does. So if you put the RO system in and you turn, you're used to getting a certain flow rate out of your tap and you want to get the same flow rate out of your RO system, you're not. It's going to be reduced uh, significantly. And that's why the, they have the storage tanks that are present there is that you can fill the storage tank up. And then if you have the storage tank filled, then when you need water, if you want the same rate as you get out of the tap, you just take it from the storage tank. Okay. Um... We had a question uh, that is a little outside of uh, your 
um, what you tested, but pe a couple people asked about like Brita filters. Would that be something that would be a possibility if someone could not afford the $200 um, RO systems? Does that do anything for microcystin? The, the Brita filters will do some reduction. They are not, they have not been tested, I think, to the extent that these systems have, at least I'm not aware of that. If you look on the NSF uh, website for systems that have been uh, tested and certified, I was not able to find one there. It's, I have to admit the website's a little difficult to use and the way the results are presented are, are confusing. They're very confusing. But, but there, there, there will be some reduction because it will absorb some of the microcystin out. Now, whether you're able to, to reduce it from, let's say four down to 0.3 as, as, as stipulated in the protocol from NSF, that, that I, I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, I wanted to ask though, um, what, you, what is the next step to this research? Um, what would be the next steps to what, if you have other plans in mind for this research, what would those be? Well, I think the, the next steps would be to look at the other congeners that exist of, the, of these toxins, and then also to look at having other materials present in the water. Uh, once again, these, these types of experiments are, can be very uh, uh, time and cost intensive, just because of the nature of trying to get the microsystems in a form, the purified microsystems in order to create model solutions, and then even doing the measurements, the microsystem concentrations. We don't have readily uh, ways of, of producing it in the quantities that are needed to do a lot of experiments, nor do we have really great ways of doing the, the measurements. And so in terms of trying to, to certify other units, other systems, and in terms of trying to look at something that's closer to what you might see coming out of your tap, given the variability in water across the world that's provided through the tap, uh, that would be the, the next step in this. A key part to this would be developing new techniques for characterizing the microsystem in the water. I think that would be probably uh, uh, equally valuable. Okay. Um, I have two remaining questions and then we'll, uh, we're past our time. Uh, so I don't want to uh, take too, more, too much more of your time. Um, one of the questions that we had was uh, dealing with like the, the screw on the faucet filters that claim to remove algal toxins. And you had mentioned comparing the two. Um, at one point during your presentation. Um, right. How do those compare in removal? Well, we have not tested those. Uh, okay. And what I would recommend, so I, I couldn't answer, it, say whether one type does or doesn't. If, there is, if the manufacturer has pursued certification through NSF, they should have that, I think, advertised with their, their product. And NSF should have that product listed on their website as having passed one of those two protocols, the 477 or the 53. Okay. Um, one last question. Um, based on the, the, your data, do you, um, do you feel that the residents of Toledo um, during the water crisis in 2014, would they have been able to consume their water had they had a filtration system like this, like any of the ones that you had talked about? If I had tested one of these systems like this, I used that membrane and for, for drinking, yes. Uh, I, I would have felt comfortable using it. But once again, I don't know that any other products other than the ones that we tested, we, have, we don't have information for them in terms of their ability to reduce microsystem level. Um, and nor do we have any idea of what is the quality control at these, at the manufacturing plants. And so uh, this is where the certification process takes it one step further is that they will, if they certify it and they are able to verify that the manufacturer is meeting certain manufacturing guidelines and that their product currently does meet the requirements for reducing microsystem level down to the desired 0.3 um, uh, micrograms per liter level, then, then certainly I would feel safe with, with, with that. But just pulling any random product off the shelf, um, I would I would not recommend that. So, 
And what were the three brands that you had you had used? The APEC, the Blue H2O, and the Whirlpool. And once again, these all will come in in slightly different configurations. So although the, the manufacturer is this, you'll see that they offer different versions of their product. So they'll have uh, not just the RO module itself, but also pre-filters and post-filters on, on the, the membrane. All right. Well, thank you. Um, it is now 1235. Uh, everyone has had their lunch. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Lipscomb again for his willingness to talk to us about his algal bloom research. It was really an excellent discussion. Thank you. Uh, also, a thank you to Christina Dickes for her work organizing this webinar. Uh, I did want to remind everyone uh, that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue on next month with Dr. David Kennedy and Dr. Stephen Haller from the University of Toledo, who will be talking about their research on uh, exposure levels of algal toxins for people with chronic illnesses. The registration link is in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Lipscomb for uh, talking with us and also the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lipscomb.